This morning, um, we, we move in a different direction. Janice mentioned last week we wrapped up our study in 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. We, we finished up that study, and now we move into a, a shorter series. Okay, it's called, we're just calling it Lean. Lean, depending on God in prayer. Lean means to depend on God in prayer. At least that's what we're, we're, the way we're using it. Um, to, to depend on God in prayer is, is something that can be challenging for us. It's something that can be very difficult. As I've been preparing for an emphasis and, and studying about prayer and teaching and preaching about prayer, I've, I've read several different books. And one of the key books is this, this book that is simply and creatively entitled Prayer. That's it. Um, by this guy named John Anwuchekwa. All right, you, you don't even try to spell it. All right, just, he's a pastor. He's a, just a great, great guy. And um, this resource has been a blessing to me, along with several others. And as I was reading one of the sections on prayer from John's book, he talked about learning how to do a backflip. He just decided one day that as a young child, he was going to learn how to do a backflip. And he thought step one in learning to, a back, to do a backflip was to do a back. Hand spring. So, so what do you do? You, you. Uh, this was guys. Okay, this is not modern. So this dude is more along, you know, the age of me. So YouTube did not exist. I know nowadays all you do is, you know, okay, where's the YouTube video? How do you do this? That's exactly what I was doing yesterday, trying to fix something that I didn't break, but I was trying to fix. But, but John, you know, back in the day, he goes to the library, his school library, and he checks out books, how to do gymnastic stuff. And he studies about how to do a back handspring. So, so he figures it out. He gets the book. He takes it home. He takes his mattress off his bed. He drags it out into the yard and he decides, man, I'm going to do the back handspring. And if you can do a back handspring, you probably know this is really not going in a good direction. But uh, you know, he's just trying to do it all by himself. And he, he starts and he tries to do his first back handspring, ends up just drilling himself in the melon. And that was it. That was it. He, he, he communicated really quickly, really easily. He said, I had to learn how to lean on my hands. If I didn't learn how to use my hands, the back handspring was not going to happen. He said, I had read about it. I had studied it. I understood the physics as a young child, how this back handspring was supposed to happen. But the problem was getting it done. The problem wasn't understanding it. The problem was executing it, getting it done. Leaning on your hands is a key part of doing a back handspring. Leaning on the Lord in prayer is a key part of being nurtured and grown and developed as a child of God. One that fully matures, that fully develops into a Christian, into a disciple, into a godly man or a godly woman. Leaning on God in prayer. So how do you do that exactly? You know, most people, pastors included, will say prayer is a vital component in your walk with the Lord or your journey in faith. But the same people will also say very frequently, it's so hard to do. It's hard to be committed to doing it on a regular basis. Many people start praying well, but few people pursue and continue praying in a committed way. How do we do it? You know, modern church has seen great innovation and development. Modern church is, is something that can look so different from one place to the next. When we gather together for worship, you, you never know what you're going to see when you walk in the doors of, of one church to the next church. Worship can look very different. Innovation is something that pastors are encouraged to pursue. But you know what? When it comes to prayer, there's not a whole lot of innovation that is required. 
Sometimes innovation can actually be a barrier or an obstacle in prayer. Innovation is not required. It's dedication. Dedication and discipline that's much more significant, much more important. Throughout history, there have been great waves of people coming to know Jesus Christ, coming to faith in Jesus Christ. We refer to them as awakenings or revivals. They've happened in this nation and almost every country around the world, or so it seems. One common denominator in each revival or awakening is the element of prayer. Many of these revivals or awakenings have had different uh, characteristics, things that have, that have been different about them, where they started among the groups of people that they were growing and flourishing and thriving. But one thing, one denominator that has always been common has been the element of prayer. If there were one metaphor for prayer that would be helpful to describe the significance of prayer in the life of a Christian, I believe it is this. Prayer is breathing. Prayer is like breathing. If you think about your life, your physical body, if your capacity to breathe is impaired, your capacity to live is impaired. When you starve your body of oxygen, bad things happen, right? When you starve your body of oxygen, for whatever reason, bad things happen. You can't think clearly. You can't function the way you want to at full capacity, at full throttle. You're starved. Prayer is breathing. Prayer is like breathing. Failure to pray is like cutting off a spiritual oxygen that allows us to function according to God's design. Prayer is breathing. For a disciple, for a follower of Jesus Christ, prayer is breathing. So, so how do we do it? What do we do? How do we pray? This, the next few weeks, initially I thought this was going to be a two-part two series, but but as I began preparing for this series, I quickly learned that this is most likely going to be a four-part series because I had two parts planned for each Sunday. And these parts were going to represent a word that, that it's an acrostic acts. It may be one that you've heard of that stands for adoration, confession, thanksgiving, and supplication. It's a method that, that people have used for a long time to teach other folks how to pray. How do we pray? Most of the times we think of prayer as simply, the, the, what we think of as, as supplication within the acrostic. The idea of asking for something. Asking for help. Asking for something that we want. But prayer is much more than that. And the acrostic acts sets us up with adoration first. Adoration, if you're not familiar with that term, it's praise. If you're not familiar with that term, you're familiar with the process. Because there are often times in our lives where we praise other people. We praise other people. We say, man, that barbecue was fantastic. You did such a great job. Your, your back handspring was wonderful. That was great. You leaned on those hands like nobody's business, unlike John Anwuchekwa, who just cracked his melon. You did a fantastic job singing this morning. What a blessing. We, we're familiar with praise. Adoration, praise, same deal. This morning, we're going to look at praise. And we're going to do that by looking at a passage of Scripture written by King David in Psalm 145. We're going to look at the first seven verses and learn about adoration and praise. Follow along with me. Hopefully, it's going to pop up on these screens. If y'all don't know, we've had some serious tech problems recently. So a matter of prayer for Sandy Level Baptist Church is that Satan would be evacuated from all these lines that you cannot see. So that we, yeah, I, we got an amen from uh, Matt Wright. A psalm of praise. I will exalt you, my God, the King. I will praise your name forever and ever. 
Every day I will praise you and extol your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. His greatness no one can fathom. One generation commends your works to another. They tell of your mighty acts. They speak of the glorious splendor of your majesty. And I will meditate on your wonderful works. They tell of the power of your awesome works. And I will proclaim your great deeds. Verse 7. They celebrate your abundant goodness and joyfully sing of your righteousness. Pray with me. Lord, your word has been preserved for generations. It reveals your power. It reveals your glory. It reveals the goodness of the gospel that changes our lives. That for those of us who have trusted in you, we are empowered and instructed by your word this morning. I pray that your spirit would awaken in us, revive us, renew us, stir us to be brought into your presence as a body of believers that we see your word and we see the adoration and praise of your name that moves us to change, that moves us to embrace the attitude and the concept and the practice of prayer like we have never done so before in the past. Father, I don't, I, I'm not deceived to believe that today everything changes in the life of this church because of one sermon. But I know that everything has changed in my life because of the presence of Jesus Christ in me. And I pray that that presence in us and among us would change us. It would move us. And may we begin by reflecting on you so that we better understand who we are. And who it is you want us to be. I pray it in Jesus name. Amen. As we dive into Psalm 145. As we look at these first seven verses of a beautiful. Beautiful psalm. We see that adoration acts. A-C-T-S. Adoration confession. Thanksgiving supplication. Adoration sets the tone of prayer. Adoration or praise sets the tone of prayer. How so? We put God first. There's sometimes in desperation where we don't necessarily need to reflect first and begin first with adoration and praising the Lord. But all too often, we treat prayer like a vending machine or like this, this place or forum where we go and just say, all right, Lord, here it is. This is... This is what I need. This is what I want. And this is what I want undone. But adoration begins by putting God first. Adoration sets the tone for prayer. Too often we only approach God in desperation with supplication. Rather than focusing on adoration. And putting Him first. Psalm 145 begins with this. Simple phrase, I will exalt you, my God, the King. I will praise your name forever and ever. As we see this passage, I will exalt you. Exalt means to lift high. Exalt means to lift high. But it says, I will lift high, my God, the King. In our nation, in our era, this, this translates differently than those who originally read it and certainly he who wrote it during an era surrounded by or marked by monarchies the concept of king was very commonly understood well understood much more so than beyond the idea of a book and and oh yes so and so was king from this date to this date the idea of a king was well understood a king was somebody who had authority, authority, control, influence. Authority in a sense that they were revered. <laughs> when the king came into someone's presence, things changed. People bowed down in the presence of the king. People knew that the king's authority, the king's power could radically change their lives. And sometimes for the worse. If you did the wrong thing in the king's presence, bad things can happen. The king could say, 
gone with you or off with your head. But the king could also say, you, I see you. I recognize what you're doing. I hear what you're saying. And the king could change someone's life forever. My God, the king, I exalt you. When we adore and praise God, we approach Him with the understanding that God is much greater than we are. Once again, the idea of knowing that. If you've grown up in the church like me, if you were a drug baby, I was a drug baby. I was one of those babies that was drugged to church nine months before I was born. I was on a pew and every Sunday thereafter, my mom drugged my tail feathers and put me there. You know that to be true, that God is greater. But knowing that to be true is different. And sometimes saying it out loud helps it sink in. Acknowledging the sovereignty or authority over everything, acknowledging the sovereignty of God helps us. It helps us to be put in our place. Below God. Acknowledging the sovereignty of God through adoration and praise helps us to be put in the place where we were designed to be under God. Not saying, my will be done, Lord. (laughs) But looking towards God and understanding His design and how we fit in. Acknowledging the sovereignty of God helps us during seasons of struggle and tragedy. Acknowledging the sovereignty and the power and the immensity of God helps us during struggle and tragedy. Because we know that God is enough. We can know that God is in control. We can be reminded that throughout history, He has been faithful and that has never changed. That He is kind and compassionate. We praise His name. God's sovereignty is related to our apathy sometimes. God's ultimate authority and power over creation might lend us an environment or a thought even that, oh, God's got it and I'm good. God's in control. He's big. I'm small. I'm, I'm safe. I'm free from responsibility. But the reality is Scripture reveals and reflects that God is sovereign and we have some level of responsibility in this life in which we live as we walk with Jesus. And there is this constant tension of understanding exactly what that is. Where does God's sovereignty stop? And my responsibility start is God's responsibility to see someone saved, right? It's what scripture reflects. Teaches clearly. Only God can save, but God has given us the responsibility of sharing the message of the gospel. And we can't allow God's sovereignty or God's authority to lead us to believe that, oh, we're off the hook. If I don't do it, it's going to get done because God is sovereign. That's not the way It works. That's not God's design. Trying to dodge the responsibility that God has given the believer or the disciple. John Anwuchekwa said in his book, Prayer is the link that connects God's sovereignty and our responsibility. Prayer is the link that connects God's sovereignty and our responsibility. And adoration allows us the privilege of understanding or reflecting or focusing on God's sovereignty and authority and power. But not escaping our responsibility. Verse 2 says, Every day I will praise you and extol your name forever and ever. Every day and forever. How frequently should we engage in prayer? Scripture says pray continually. You're like, whoa, whoa, wait a second. You, am I supposed to just start, you know, get one of those, those, little, those little canes, you know, those poles and walk around with my eyes closed and pray all the time? Is that what the Bible's telling me to do? No. That's not it. Scripture says to pray continually. 
very true, very accurate, very beneficial. Praying continually, an attitude of prayer, a practice of prayer. This passage of Scripture reflects on praising God consistently. You know, all too often in our lives, we embrace complaint much more easily than we embrace praise. It's kind of ironic, to be honest with you. Think about David and the era in which he lived. King David. King. Over all of these people. He's, he is the one that God used to pen this passage. He was king over all. Yet if we today had to live as David lived, even when he was in the opulence of his palace, we would be like, oh my goodness. There's no reception. Uh, how, how do I get from A to B? How do I get this done? I don't have YouTube. What, wait a second. The, the, the AC is off. Somebody go push the button. Turn it on. We live in an era that is unlike any other in history where we are surrounded by comfort and blessing and goodness and stuff that no one else in history has known before us. You know, I, I recently read something on Facebook. It said, I told my kids that I am older than Google. And they didn't believe me. Well, guys, most of us in this room are older than Google. Yet, despite all the convenience of our days... We still find ways to focus on what we don't have or what we want or what we think we should have that is broken right now. Or not functioning to full speed or the bandwidth which we prefer. But praise and putting God first puts us in a perspective of seeing God and understanding our design and being grateful for what God has given us and Understanding how blessed we are. Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. Verse 3. His greatness no one can fathom. This is big too. This is big too. You see, in, in, our, uh, in, in our era, our, constant, or our, cons, our context rather, right now, we may think we understand a lot. If, if you've been a believer in Jesus for a long time or studied the Bible a lot, you might think, we well, you know so much about the Lord. But the reality is, Scripture reveals no one can really fathom God's goodness. And the more you learn about the Lord, the more you realize there's some stuff we will never completely comprehend until we're in His presence. Until we're right there in His presence. You don't know how many people I've talked to that are parents that have said, you know, I, I remember giving people parental advice before I had, had children. I thought I, I knew, I, you know, I studied that in school. I read this book. This person was a professional. They had all this alphabet soup after their name that proved it. And they wrote these books and these papers. They even spoke at conferences. And I read it and I regurgitated it. And then I had kids. I couldn't fathom what that was like. I didn't know what it was like to have to stay awake every night. Not to be able to say, hey, can you change the diaper when there was no other you around? Or to say, what, what do we do? The baby can't tell us what's wrong, but we see something's off. Because they couldn't fathom what it was like to be parents. <laughs> they thought they could, but then they were. God's greatness is something that we will never truly fathom. But the closer and closer we're drawn into his presence, the more and more we understand. 
and the more overwhelmed we will become in a very positive way. Sometimes it may be fearful to be in God's presence, but it will ultimately be a blessing. Verse 4 says, One generation commends your works to another. They tell of your mighty acts. One generation commends your works to another. Throughout history, God's name has been elevated in praise and in adoration. Sometimes by a small remnant that he has preserved by his sovereignty, by way of his authority. But what we see as you study scripture, you will come to understand how his word has been proclaimed, how his name has been praised consistently and throughout history. Before the words were written, they were spoken, handed down by way of oral tradition. The stories were told from father to son, from father to son, and from mother to daughter and mother to daughter, talking about the goodness of God, talking about how Moses was blown away. When he saw this bush on fire. And how he was able to enter into the presence of a Pharaoh. As a fugitive. And see God. Radically change. The lives of a group of slaves. Who were set free. They were God's people. From generation to generation. We can choose to be a part of that. We can choose to avoid it. But it will continue. And when we choose to be a part of that. We will be a part of the blessing. In a way. That is unique. If we choose to avoid it. Verse 5 says, they speak of the glorious splendor of your majesty. That's more king talk, right? <laughs> your majesty. Your glorious splendor. And I will meditate on your wonderful works. You know, guys, sometimes praise and adoration is not simply the cookie cutter words and phrases that we have stored up in our Christian vocabulary or our prayer vocabulary that we may have developed over the years. Sometimes it's extremely beneficial to take time to be still and to even be quiet and reflect upon the awesomeness of God. Yesterday, I had the privilege of sitting still. I've got four kids and, and I don't always get to sit still. My wife and three of the older ones were gone, so I rarely sat still while that happened. But I sat still. I'm not, I'm not like this huge nature dude. You know, I'm, I, uh, I enjoy nature. I, I, we live kind of in the woods in the middle of somewhere, not nowhere, but the middle of somewhere. And, and I was just looking around and reflecting on, man, these trees are massive. God created this system that allowed them to be birthed from the tiniest little thing. And today, surrounding me, there are trees that existed for probably over a hundred years. Their girth I cannot contain within my own reach. And each season, these leaves pop up. And then there are a trillion acorns that pelt my house and my ground and and it's just amazing and then there are all of these birds and and then above that there's the sky and the clouds and the the beauty and I've sometimes most of the time I don't think about that I just keep on driving I just keep on walking because I got other stuff to do and my stuff is important I think my stuff is important, man. So I got to do my stuff and I go and do my stuff. And what happens is all the time I'm surrounded by something that is much more awesome and much greater than my stuff. And how often do I think about that? God's stuff is really, really good. And, and when we stop and meditate on it and reflect on it, it just kind of changes things. It changes things for us. Once again, that is part of God's design. Reflect on Scripture, what God has done. Reflect on 
the things God has done, the works He's done, His creation, the sun and the moon and the stars, and then the tiniest things that surround us. Wrapping it up. We're wrapping it up. I promise I won't go too, too long. Sunday school teachers, fear not. They tell, they tell the power of your awesome works, and I will proclaim your great deeds. What stories of praise do other people tell? Think about that. Janice got up here prior to my message and shared about missionaries who go around the world to share the message of the gospel. And it is awesome to hear the message or the stories that sometimes they tell us. It is so cool. In the 1950s, there were a, a group of uh, men and women, families, there were these young people that decided they wanted to take the message of the gospel into the dark corners to the primitive peoples. Jim Elliott, Ed McCulley, Roger Yodarian, Pete Fleming, and Nate Saint were men and their spouses too that decided to take the message of the gospel to the primitive peoples in South America, Ecuador specifically. They, wrote, they, they located this primitive tribe, this tribe known as the Alka, sometimes also described as the Warani, and, and they found them from a plane, from one of those tiny little planes that, you know, most of us are scared to fly. And they, they saw them, they're like, wow, they're, they're, there's this group, and, and these were violent peoples. They lived in an era uh, that, that was made primarily different for these people. Because though the world around them was becoming more civilized, their lives had changed very little. They defended themselves at all costs. But, but these five men decided they wanted to take the message of the gospel to these people. They developed a system to deliver gifts. And they would take this plane and circle around and circle and circle and circle and drop gifts for them. And eventually they decided themselves to go. The families feared for their health and their safety, but they still felt compelled to go. And as they went, the diary of Jim Elliott tells us some about their encounters. There was some progress made. There was some traction that happened in, in just to trying to develop a relationship. But what we know happened is that something occurred that just turned the switch immediately. And each of these five men died at the tip of a spear trying to share the message of the gospel. But the story didn't end there. Because God's good. <laughs> and he does different stuff. Elizabeth Elliot and Rachel Saint, the spouses or widows of two of the women, continued to pursue the people. The people that had killed their husbands, they studied the Alka language. They learned, and not only did they learn, but a door opened for Elizabeth Elliot and her three-year-old daughter, along with Rachel Saint, to go live with the people that had killed their spouses. They had not been transformed by the power of the gospel, but she was going because she had been empowered by the gospel. And she went and eventually... A leader of that tribe came to her and said, what are you doing here? And she said, you guys are the ones that killed my husband and her husband and the husbands of three other men. But we are here to share the message of the gospel. We are here to show you the love of Jesus Christ. We're here, though that was tragic, that was difficult, we come and deliver the message of the gospel and that tribe was forever changed. Minkai is one of the, the leaders, one of the warriors who killed the men. The men who killed the missionaries that went to bring the saving message of the gospel. Their lives were transformed. So much so that some came to the United States and told people about the power of the gospel. About the stories that were told them that changed their lives forever. They transformed their lives from carrying a spear to protect them to carrying a whole nother weapon to radically change families that surrounded them. The power of Jesus Christ, the power of the gospel, that's the story that we can tell. That's the praise that we can reflect on. 
today we're going to close our, our, our worship service in prayer as we sing praise. I'll invite Matt, you can come on up and we're going we're gonna to close out. The last part of the passage today says, They celebrate your abundant goodness and joyfully sing of your righteousness. God's good. If you're here this morning, there's a message that Jim Elliott wrote down in his diary that said, He is no fool who gives up what he can never keep to gain what he can never lose. If you're here this morning, God has something to offer you that you can never lose. Never. And that is salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. If you have not made the decision or understand who Jesus is, good news is you're in the right place at the right time. God has ordained, has arranged a time for you to be here. It's on purpose that you're here to hear the gospel, to hear about what God has done, because God wants to do something in you. That's why we're here. If you need to or desire to learn more about Jesus or begin a journey of faith, then it's time to talk. We can talk after this service. We can talk during this service later on today. But it's time to have a conversation about who Jesus is, about what he wants to do for you.